Okay. We are recording. Okay, I think we're all here. Um, if not, I am recording. I just always intend to record and it's like a 50 50 shot with me I am so I am making an extra special effort here to remember to hit that magic button because when we find out that we need a recording if I haven't hit play yet it's too late so I really need to really need to get on the ball um let me share screen here since we're all in and that should be I don't have to mess with PowerPoint this time thankfully um, so we've got a lot on the agenda today and, you know, who knows, <laughs> we will amend this agenda as needed. I think since we're all in here, we will go ahead and just go in the order that I had put things up on the, the whiteboard here, which means the first thing we're going to be doing is the 6.2 quiz. So um, a note about that, it's two problems, since 6.2 problems tend to be longer, a little bit harder than what we had done in 6.1. So last class, we looked at, we did together, I think I turned you guys loose on these to kind of practice and experiment. And then I came behind and um, adjusted as needed. Last class, we looked at I believe it was 17 and 19. Let me make sure. Yeah, 17 and 19, which are very similar to 16 and 18. So that's why I chose those two specific problems for the quiz. And we're gonna go ahead and do this in class, which we will not be doing every single time. It's just at this stage where we are in chapter six, what's going on with everybody. We're going to go ahead and just knock the quizzes this week out of the way in class. Um, a little bit maybe of time um, due to 6.3 not being quite as um, content heavy as 6.1, 6.2. Okay, but I do want to make sure before I turn everybody loose on the quiz, I do want to make sure that everybody's um, internet is okay at this point, because if not, we'll wait till later in the class to, um, to attempt the quiz. Okay, so Valor, I can see you. It looks like you're all there. Um, My internet's just a little fuzzy today. Little it wasn't, fuzzy. wasn't connecting when I was trying to get into class. That's the only okay. thing. Okay, it looked fuzzy to me. Like, I looked fuzzy to me when I logged in, so who knows? <laughs> Um, Max or Sarah, are you guys um, able to see and hear at this point? We can right now, but I just want to let you know, we keep like leaving, not completely, but just disconnecting for a few seconds. Okay, gotcha. Can you see the screen? Yes. What was the last thing you wrote about multiplying polynomials? The last thing I wrote was in orange lettering at the top of the screen, right next to where it says 6.2 quiz. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry at the bottom. All right, I have okay. everything. We'll go ahead, if you guys have your textbook too, I mean, you don't have to rely on my writing. We'll go ahead and I'm gonna give you guys, after I write these problems up on the board, I'm gonna give you guys, you know, 10, 12, 13 minutes to do it like last time. And if Max and Sarah, if your internet just goes out, um, at least you will have, you know, you can do that and then send it to me whenever the internet um, resurrects itself later on. So these are the problems. And Number 18, which has a lot more going on, so I want to make sure I copy it bigger and clearer. So that's A's and B's. Ms. Savannah? Yeah. Are we on 6.1, 2, or 3, or 4? This is, 
And hang on, I feel like I'm going to write a different number. We are right now here where I'm drawing a little star. We're doing the 6.2 quiz. So yeah, I know there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of sections in play right now, but 6.2 we are doing for our quiz problems number 16 and 18. So if your internet holds out, you can look at those on my screen here. If not, you can you know grab your textbook and look at them there. And I'm gonna say, okay, starting right now, this is 10.06 by my clock. Um, let's go till 10.18, so let's go 12 minutes. So you guys go ahead, jump on that. I'll set an alarm on my end and hopefully we'll all be here <laughs> able to see and hear the screen when that ends. Let me mute myself so I don't distract you guys and good luck.
Okay, so it is 10, 18 or 19. I kind of turned off my alarm, gave you guys a few extra seconds just to wrap it up. Um, and again, uh, before you send it to me, just make sure, because I always forget to say this at the beginning of the quiz, it's always in the instructions, instructions in the problem, but I don't always get it in my instructions. Make sure your exponents at the end are all positive. So it's okay if you have negative exponents at any stage in the problem while you're working through the steps, but basically last thing you do should be to turn everything positive. So, and again, it's just sort of a thing we do in algebra. And the benefit of that doesn't really reveal itself unless they give you numbers to plug in later. Um, otherwise, it just feels sort of like a, a mindless exercise. But once we get to the stage where maybe this is a word problem and we have to say, okay, A and B here are given values later. A is five and B is seven then it makes more sense to have everybody be with a positive power at the end. Okay, so that was our 6.2 quiz. Um, we are not going to be doing a quiz on 6.3 because there just wasn't enough super important, super tough stuff there. We're going to move on to our next quiz with 6.4. And I'll think about when I see how we do today, I'll think about whether that's going to be in class next Tuesday or whether that is going to be something that you turn into me kind of on your own time. So we'll take that, we'll play that by ear. So what we need to do now is talk about just a couple of things from 6.3. So um, closing the book on 6.2 for the moment, we're going to talk about the challenge problems that I gave you from 6.3. And they're challenge problems mostly because they deal with function notation. And function notation is just never anybody's favorite, but it's really important to get comfortable with it because it comes up again and again throughout, I would say really the rest of math. You never get away from it once you've arrived at this stage in math. Um, future classes and such, just assume that you can use function notation. Um, so let me put, function notation in the notes here. And I did notice as I was looking at 6.4 to see what exactly we're headed into today, they go a little bit farther with the concepts that they threw at you unannounced in 6.3. So I think I understand why they were doing that. They were just sort of prepping you for something, but not telling you what they were prepping you for. So um, in problem number 115, from 6.3, you're told at the very top of the set of these problems, I think it's 111 through 118, you've got a set of functions and they chose to label their functions P, Q, and R. Now the problem I'm giving us here, I'm just gonna write down what we're facing. We only need to worry about the function that is called Q of X and the function that is called r of x. p of x doesn't come into play in number 115 at all. So I'm gonna write off to the side here that they told us the function called q looks like this. It's one of these polynomials that we talked about. And the function called r, also a polynomial since everything in 6.3 was a polynomial. r looks like this. And notice just for a second as kind of a review on polynomials since I didn't give you a ton of homework about the terminology. Notice that function Q and function R are both in what we call descending order. Meaning if you just focus on the X's, Q of X starts with an X to the second, then it drops down to an X to the first. And that three there at the end, it's got an X to the zero. That's a one, um, so it's, we don't usually write it, but just know that it's there. And R of X drops from X to the second down to X to the zero. Notice that it skips X to the first, and that's okay. Just because a polynomial is in descending order doesn't mean that it literally has to hit every single number on the number line as it descends. Just as long as two, your biggest exponent, is bigger than zero, your next exponent, you still 
are fitting that qualification for polynomials. Okay, so what we're told to do here, using the function notation, this is just telling us to multiply the number two by our polynomial q of x, and then subtract our polynomial r of x. And the only thing in terms of setup that we have to kind of remember to introduce ourselves, and I'm gonna do it with brackets, kind of like they've been doing, we need to remember to protect the polynomial called r of x in its own set of parentheses, because that negative needs to distribute to every single piece of r of x. So if I rewrite what they gave me, instead of using the names of the polynomials, if I use the polynomials themselves. So I'm gonna come over here, give myself a little bit more space. Two times Q of X, just like I had before, but now Q of X is going to be the four X squared minus six X plus three. And then minus, once again, these are the brackets that I had to remember to put in myself. And the reason they're using brackets and not parentheses is just to avoid confusion with already having parentheses as part of the function notation. That's totally up to you. I found that algebra classes are very careful to keep their notation as clear as possible. And I know it doesn't feel that way a lot of the time, but what amazed me about like all of the just picky little rules and notational quirks that I was taught in algebra, the higher up I got in math, they went out the window. When I got to college level, there were parentheses and more parentheses and more parentheses and nobody cared that they were all parentheses. Nobody made any attempt to break out brackets or anything like that. So um, that was kind of funny because you get in these habits and then you find teachers that just break them and that's fine. This is just basically for our benefit. So what we've got to do is distribute this two, since it's two times the whole polynomial, every bit of the polynomial, every piece of the polynomial needs a two multiplied to it. So two times four, eight X squared, two times negative six, negative 12 X, two times three, that's a six. So that takes care of two times Q of X. And then minus R of X, like we learned last time, to subtract another polynomial, you just distribute the negative. And then all you have to worry about doing is adding like terms. You don't have to worry about subtraction per se once that negative has kind of made its way across the parentheses. So we've got x squared term here, x squared term here. So I'm just kind of underlining my x squared terms using the same little code. We've got x to the first, but there's only one of that term. So negative 12x is going to appear as negative 12x in our answer. And then we've got a couple of just plain old numbers. So our final answer, eight minus five, let's say three x squared take that negative 12x just as is, and then six plus seven, you've got a plain 13. So if we're careful about the order that we perform the addition, we should end up with a polynomial that's also in descending order, just like the two original ones were. Um, they don't usually make an issue out of that. They don't require descending order a lot of the times. It's just a good habit to get in. It makes your polynomial clearer if you have to do any work with it in the future. Okay, so that was the first kind of challenge problem there. If they're telling you to do some multiplication prior to adding or subtracting your polynomials, that's the way they might tell you to do it. The other challenge problem, the one that really foreshadows what we've got going on um, later on today, briefly, I think, it's not a huge part of what we're doing. Um, 119, they give us this polynomial, P of X. Very simple polynomial, 2X minus three. Back in the day, we would have identified that as a straight line. P of X, just like F of X or any other function notation, that's just standing in for what we would have called Y back in the day. So Y equals 2X minus three, that's a straight line. It's got a slope of two 
It's got a y-intercept with negative three. We know now that in addition to being a straight line, it's also a polynomial. And that's the angle we're kind of focusing on in this chapter. So we've got to do three things to this P of X. Um, so part A, we have to create something called P of A instead of what we had before, which was P of X. Part B, back to using X's, but this time we're told our X has to be negative. And then the part that really is really, really important. This is the part that trips everybody up for the rest of forever. Um, I'll go ahead and tell you the reason they start torturing us with this sort of stuff in part C. It really is a preview of a preview of a preview of something that happens in calculus all the time. It's so complicated when you get to calculus. They start you all the way back in algebra learning how to deal with just this version of it, this kind of simplified version of it. So the theory being when you get to calculus, you'll be like good to go with it. Now P of A, all I have to do, this is not math per se. Um, your original polynomial P with an X inside of it, you're just gonna restructure that as all your X is turning into A's. So no math, just make it 2A minus three where it used to be 2x minus 3. They're literally just switching out the letter. We've talked a little bit about how the letters we use are kind of arbitrary in a way. They're, we're so used to using x and y, but we can use a and b, p and q. You know, it doesn't matter. So that's all they're doing here is taking advantage of the fact that the notation doesn't really matter. Um, now, on the other hand, if you are told to put in a negative x, there is a little bit of math here. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to bring out my handy orange marker here. I need a set of parentheses just to be extra careful here. I need to multiply um, this 2 by a negative x. The rule is, based off of the function here, whatever input we give this function, we have to multiply that input by two immediately and then subtract three. I had a teacher one time that would break away from like math notation entirely. And she would go into like hearts and smiley faces because a function is again, just a rule about what you do to your input. And so we're being told whatever our input is, multiply it by two. So our input here happens to be negative x. What I don't want to do, this is bad. It was easy enough to just write two times positive x minus three. I don't want to write two times negative x minus three without those parentheses because the parentheses are what keep this as a multiplication problem and prevent it from turning into some kind of weird extra subtraction. So parentheses, super necessary. And I'm gonna keep that in parentheses itself. So if P of negative X is two times negative X minus three, I can simplify this two times negative X just a little bit. Two times negative X is just negative 2x, that's a nicer way of writing that. Gets rid of the parentheses. Of course, there's not a lot we can do past that point because we don't have any like terms. But negatives, as always, they can be tricky. Even though this is a really simple problem, um, almost the simplicity is, is misleading. So that's all you end up with. The negative kind of comes out to the front just because that's where we're used to seeing our negatives. Now, the final part here, Again, the rule is whatever our input is, we multiply it by two and then subtract three. Now our input here is an addition problem. So even though to our eyes, X and H look like two things, we wanna treat them as one thing. So this whole thing, X plus H, this is our input. And yeah, the, 
the choice of the H there, again, that is, is a, a preview of calculus. There, that H has a specific meaning. Um, for us, we just need to make sure we don't mess up how we're going to handle this. So just like with the negative X, I have to remember to put my own set of parentheses there so that the X and the H get brought in together. And so I'm going to do this. So again, this is bad, very common. Um, 2x plus h with no parentheses. If you do that, the x comes out fine. It gets the 2 multiplied, just like it should. But the h is all left out. And in reality, whatever happens to the 2 has to happen to the h because they're both part of the same input. So let me rewrite down here. That's the setup, and more math than we had in either of the previous two parts. We have to distribute our two very carefully. 2x, 2h, now the x and the h have both been treated the same. And then that minus three, off to the end, nothing really happens to that. Take a quick look, make sure there's no like terms hiding in there, and there aren't. And then we can box that up. So I would say make sure you can understand and do part C. Um, there's something that we'll get to later on today that picks up on this part C and um, hammers on it a little bit harder. It's a really, really important skill to be able to plug, I'm going to say plug a math problem into another math problem. You're plugging a little addition into a bigger like polynomial. Okay, any questions about that before we move on to the rest of 6.3? Just about the mechanics of it. Um, just make sure you feel like you can handle a problem that's basically like that. Okay, so the only other thing from 6.3 that they throw in kind of randomly. Talking about shapes of polynomial graphs, and I'm going to say common polynomial graphs. We've talked a little bit about what I was calling the library of functions. So I'm going to use the word function here too to tie back into that. Um, we learned about some basic shapes, and I'm trying to remember what chapter that was. It might have been chapter three. Who knows? Um, in 6.3, what they tell us is basically how to tell the difference between a polynomial function that is like x squared plus a bunch of terms and a polynomial that is x cubed plus a bunch of terms. That's all we're doing. We're comparing, and again, this is in descending order, so x squared needs to be the biggest thing that you've got going on, and x cubed needs to be the biggest thing over here. That's all we're doing, is just telling these two categories of functions apart. Now, I call it x squared versus x cubed, but realistically, there's usually some kind of a, a number, a visible number, a number that's not one, sitting out here in front. They call it the coefficient. We've used that word just a little bit. Haven't talked about it too much. So an example of an x squared polynomial could be like 5x squared plus 2x minus 9. We could get an example of an x cubed polynomial, maybe 3x cubed minus 2x squared plus 6x minus 14. Um, other examples, I'm going to lead off with a negative here. Um, remember that we can skip terms. We don't always have to have x to the first there. Um, let me see. I make this negative. We have something like that. So all kinds of different ways, as long as we start off with an x cubed and then trail off from there. 
or we start off with an x squared and then trail off in there. So the main thing that we want to practice is, um, and let me put that word coefficient in here in the notes for us. So this is um, this polynomial that has a 5x squared. That's an example of when you have a positive coefficient. Negative 4, that's an example of a negative coefficient. And same thing over here, I purposely put in a positive and a negative because that's going to change how your graph looks. They'll have the same basic shape, but one will be like flipped upside down from the other. Okay, so that gives us basically two main categories, the x squared polynomials and the x cubed polynomials. And within each of those categories, there are two choices, plus or minus. So let me summarize all this, and then we'll just look at the pictures. Are you heading out? Okay. Um, so this is x squared polynomials. And then this over here will be x cubed polynomials. I don't remember. And I don't really care. I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah, they don't use the words for this, but I'm going to use the words. An x squared polynomial, because I think we've mentioned this briefly before, is called a quadratic polynomial. They will definitely get back around to that terminology later on in the book. And then an x cubed is a cubic there are not special names for all the polynomials in the world. We usually end around x cubed. I think x to the fourth, you can call that a quartic polynomial if you want to, but I don't know a lot of people who do. Um, and then we'll separate these off. Okay. If x squared has a positive coefficient, this might look familiar because we actually did cover this before. Basically, what's going to happen is you're going to have a U shape that points up. So I'll go ahead since this is the only part that we've had before. X squared has a negative coefficient. The U shape is just going to point down instead of up. So that's the only difference. You're dealing with some kind of a U both times. It's just one point's up, up for positive. The other point's down, down for negative. Okay, so X squared is pretty nice. It's pretty easy to work with. X cubed is easy as well. It's just not as easy. I don't like drawing X cubed polynomials. They make a little swiggle is basically what happens. Um, one side should point up one side should point down and that gets a little bit weird because when you flip your x cubed upside down I feel like i'm going to totally screw this up um in fact i feel like i already screwed that up did i already screw that up no i did not <laughs> um you have to remember between positive and negative x cubes which one starts low and finishes high? Which one starts high and finishes low? So low to high, that's the positive coefficient. High to low, that's the negative coefficient. And then they just kind of make a mountain and then a valley or a valley and then a mountain roughly. Um, so the reason they give us this is just maybe to avoid in some problems the necessity of having to plot a bunch of points and figure out the shape of a graph. Um, and they give you some practice with that. But I just want to make you aware so that you're used to what these things look like as we go forward into the course. Um, again, nothing. I, I didn't give you homework on that. There won't be a quiz on that. Because <laughs> there is so much other stuff that um, I do have to quiz you on, test you on, et cetera. So moving on to 6.4, speaking of stuff that I have to quiz and test you on. 
Remember how in 6.3, last few minutes of class, we learned how to add and subtract polynomials? Pretty quick, pretty easy. Basically an exercise in can you identify like terms and can you add them together? 6.4, we start multiplying polynomials. This is so, so um, I guess, much, so much harder than adding and subtracting that it gets its own section. Dividing polynomials is so hard that it gets its own chapter. So we won't get to that until chapter seven. We have so much else to do that is related to multiplying polynomials. Um, now, they start us out really small and this is gonna be flashback to a lot of 6.1 rules, which is good. We have kind of left 6.1 behind in a way, but in another sense, we never really do because we have to keep using like the product rule that we learned in 6.1 over and over again. So the first category that we wanna learn is how do you multiply um, two monomials. And I'm not gonna say two because there could be a case we have three or something. Remember that a monomial is a one term polynomial. And in a way, even though we're using fancy terminology, you kind of already know how to do this. This cropped up in 6.1. So I'm just gonna start here right from the beginning. The first practice problem, here's what it looks like. 3x to the fourth times 2x squared. That's just a couple of terms that happen to have exponents. And we're gonna be multiplying them using the rules we learned in 6.1. We now know that we can call these things monomials because each one is a single term polynomial. And the way that we did this back earlier in chapter six was we would often regroup. Now you don't have to regroup. Um, if you feel like extra steps are helpful, this is always an option. You can group the coefficients, the numbers that are not exponents, you can group them in their own thing. And then you can group the exponents in their own thing. And the benefit of doing it that way is the coefficients just get multiplied like we've been doing since the, the very first days that we could multiply numbers at all. Three times two just gives us a six. The other part, the x to the fourth and the x squared, that's where you need your um, product rule. And so you're gonna take the six, add it to the two. Once again, you'll get six. So you get six x to the six. Very simple. You learned absolutely no math out of this example. You just learned that now you can call these things monomials. Part B looks a little bit worse because they throw multiple different variables at us. We've got the variable M, the variable N, the variable P, just kind of running down the alphabet there. Um, in case you're wondering why they skip O, because O looks too much like zero. So you'll never see um, O used as a letter in math. Or I guess I should never say never, but it would be rare and I don't think I've ever seen it. All right, so this, you are welcome to regroup once again. And I think I'll do that one more time just to help us see what that looks like. And also because this particular problem does have a lot of variables. So what you're doing is you're grouping the coefficients, then you're grouping each type of letter, each type of variable separately. Um, the benefit of this is it avoids you starting to try and multiply P's to N's or something. And then at the end, you are multiplying negative five times negative eight, just like usual. And the rest of this is just an exercise in adding powers. So if it helps you, all of these guys here can have a first power. Sometimes it's nice to look at that. So we are going to have M to the fifth, we add four plus one n to the second, we add one plus one, and p to the eighth, we add 
3 plus 5. Okay, so a bit trickier, but nothing that you haven't done before. So let's move on to what happens in the next category. This time we're multiplying um, a monomial by any other <laughs> type of polynomial. So in other words, we'll have a one-term polynomial, but the other polynomial can be two terms, three terms, five terms, we don't care. We just care that one of them happens to be a monomial. And what that looks like, they give us a pretty healthy selection here in the second practice problem. And I'm gonna write these out. Well, can I do that? No, maybe I won't. I was gonna say I wanna write them all out where we can see them, but that might mess up what I've got going on. Let me see what happens here. I tend to write too big to do what I think I was gonna do. Um, I can at least get A and B next to each other so we can compare. So notice that um, out front, we have our monomials. So 3x, that's a one-term polynomial. And negative 5a squared is a one-term polynomial as well. Monomials tend to always go out front. It's just where it's easier to put them. It's where it's easier to proceed with the math. They don't need their own set of parentheses because nothing is being added or subtracted within a monomial. It's just a little multiplication. Now, you are always welcome to put parentheses around them if you would like, but that's totally optional. And the way that we handle this is by the distributive property. So 3x is going to be multiplied to 7x, and then 3x is going to be multiplied to negative 1. 7x minus 1 happens to be what they call a binomial, but we don't really care. The fact is it's just some other polynomial. So if you would like a middle step on this problem, it's going to look like, well, potentially you could have a couple of middle steps. 3x times 7x, and then 3x is positive here. So as I distribute it to the next term, I'm going to say plus 3x times negative one. Now, it might get to the point where putting in too many middle steps starts confusing us. What we would do at this stage in a previous problem is we would regroup. We put the three and the seven right next to each other. We put the x's right next to each other. At some point, you're probably going to hit a stage where it feels like that slows you down. Um, I know it's definitely true for me where Sometimes if I put in too many middle steps, I'll start tripping. I'll lose the momentum of the problem, basically. So I will talk carefully through this, but I won't actually write that middle step anymore. So we have two multiplications that we have to deal with. The first one, there's a 3 and an x multiplied to a 7 and an x. So the 3 and the 7 can multiply as usual and become a 21. And the x's, they're both that invisible little power of one. We're going to be adding their exponents. This is the product rule. Everything's multiplied to everything else within this little group. So that's a 21x squared. And then finally, at the end, 3x times negative one is just a negative 3x. I would say because really we're just repeating the product rule over and over in these problems. Um, we're not incorporating like every single rule from 6.1 and 6.2 all the way down. But I would say that these problems that we're doing, the, the chances of just randomly messing stuff up are pretty high because you're not just focusing on your exponent rules anymore. You're focusing on like a bigger, broader multiplication. So 
this is where we start seeing things like people multiplying the powers instead of adding the powers. When back in 6.1, they knew exactly what to do. So just be really careful as you go through this, um, particularly as we've gotten part B, as your polynomials start getting bigger. So my monomial, negative 5a squared, it gets distributed across three different pieces. Additionally, it happens to be negative. So I've got to be careful that every time I write my monomial, it's got a negative leading it off. Um, so there you go. If you have a three part, you've got a trinomial here in the second set of parentheses, you should see three of your uh, monomial that was distributed. So very carefully here, because there are negatives flying all over the place. We have negative 15, a to the fourth. We have plus 30, a to the third. And we have negative 25, a squared. Last piece there, that a squared just drops down in the final answer because there wasn't another power of a for it to product rule together with. Okay, stop me if at any point all of the, you know, the negatives and the multiplying and the adding just kind of throw you off. If, there, if you feel like you're missing a step, because um, there's a ton of examples in this, in this section just to expose you to a broad range of problems that you could see. Um, they're very repetitive in one sense, just conceptually, but in another sense, because the book will change up the variables as you see here and the book will change up how many terms we're dealing with, it can feel like going from one problem to another is like apples and oranges. Okay, so the monomial in the front is getting nastier. It's got two variables in it. It's got a negative, but it's still a monomial because everything is multiplied together. And we are very carefully going to have to distribute it all the way across that three-term polynomial in the parentheses. Okay. Um, sometimes if I've got, it was easier when I just had physically like two markers in my hand, but sometimes when things just get huge, I like to literally color code so that the thing that I am multiplying by here, that's the blue thing. And then the pieces of the second polynomial are gonna go in parentheses right behind each, each blue thing. Okay, so you should be able to maybe more clearly see, there's my original polynomial there in the black, and there's the result of the distributive property there in the blue. So that's just distributive properties over at that stage. I just have to clean up, um, clean up what's left, which is where the bulk of the work is going to be. Okay, so in this first multiplication, I've got a negative times a positive. So big picture, this term needs to be negative. Specifically, it needs to be negative five out there in front. Okay, the M's, there need to be three of them because there was one and then multiplied by N to the second. So adding power, you get three. And there need to be five N's. First term over. The second piece here is going to be a negative two. Add the powers of the M's, add the powers of the end. Third term. This one will come out positive. You have a negative times a negative. You have n to the second. There's nothing for n to the third to multiply to, so it just appears as itself there in the final answer. These things get longer and longer, but that whole thing that I've boxed in, that is your answer. That's your new polynomial. 
Okay, if that wasn't fun enough, now we have to move to the point where we can multiply any two polynomials, meaning the first one doesn't have to be a monomial. Yeah, and we'll just keep it two at this point. They will, of course, at some point start throwing you three, but start basic, multiplying any two polynomials. And the way that we handle this without losing our minds is to relate it back to what we were just doing. So let me get the first one of these written up, which thankfully is fairly short. They have a nice, easy binomial two pieces there, multiply to another nice, easy binomial. So nobody's got three terms. What we're going to do is focus our attention on the first polynomial, just like we've been doing all the way through. And, um, okay, wow. I thought the book was doing something totally different, but they're actually going about this the way I do. This x plus five, we can pretend just for a minute that x is a, mono, is, is a monomial. Pretend this is the only thing we've got going on back in previous problems. I'm going to take that x and multiply it, distribute it across your other polynomial like that. So you're going to have x times 2x and x times 3. So let me just handle that. Plus x times 3. So the first stage, pretty simple. We're ignoring that 5 entirely. We're just working with that x and distributing it across the 2x plus 3. What we'll do in the next step is similar idea, only this time we're going to work with the 5. This time we will use the 5. We'll ignore the x. So the 5 will distribute to the 2x, and the 5 will distribute to the 3. So what this will look like it's like this, 2x, 3. So watch that part carefully. This part of this middle step is probably still really beneficial. So you should see 2x plus 3 appearing twice in the next step. So I've got it here, 2x and 3, 2x and 3. Each time it's got something different in front of it. Because first it was the x's term to distribute, and then next it was the 5's term to distribute. So we started out with um, a binomial and a binomial. We end up with four terms. Then we just got to clean them up a little bit. So x times 2x, I'm just taking those powers and adding them. The 2 can come out front where it usually sits. That's going to be a 2x squared. x times 3, nothing really needs to be done to that mathematically. We're just going to switch the order. 3 comes out front, 3 is a coefficient, like we've been talking about. Here, down towards the end, we've got 5 times 2, which is 10, still attached to that same x because nothing has happened to it. And then finally, 5 times 3, 15. Now, unlike when we were dealing with a monomial times something, when we're dealing with a monomial times something, we never had to worry about cleaning up too much after our multiplication. But here, notice that you've got like terms there in the middle. So it wouldn't be considered correct to stop where I am now. You need to go one step farther, add together your 3x and your 10x. And then of course your 15 at the end and your 2x squared at the beginning, nothing happened to them. They had no buddies, they had no like terms. So that's how we handle multiplying any two polynomials in the world. 
um, any two multi-term polynomials in the world, we just take that monomial process that we were doing and repeat it over and over and over again until we run out of pieces to drag across that second polynomial. So the best way to learn this is just to dive into more examples. This one, we've got um, still a nice two-term thing out front, but now we've got a three-term, a trinomial behind it. So I'm going to stick with my color coding for now while we're still new at this. So the distribution, these are the type of multiplications you've got to worry about. And then after that, the second distribution. So just looking at my arrows, notice that I've got six arrows. I've got three orange ones and three green ones. So you should have like six terms spread out across your screen. Okay, so I'm going to stick with the color coding here while I can. Um, so 3x is going to be multiplied to three pieces. It's going to be multiplied to, not negative one, goodness. It's going to be multiplied to x squared. Plus 3x. It's going to be multiplied to negative six and it's going to be multiplied to 2. Now, if you so desire, you can pause at this stage and clean that up. I am going to keep, just so we don't lose the momentum too much, I'm going to keep going with my negative 1, distributing it all the way across. So it's the 3x's term, then it's the negative 1's term. Whoops, I landed with a... Bigger pin point there, didn't I? X squared, negative six X and two. All right, so very carefully, all six of these terms, I get three X cubed, I get minus 18x squared plus 6x. That takes care of the orange multiplications. Then I get negative x squared, positive, being careful with the minus signs there, 6x, and negative 2. Now, enough with the multiplication, but I still have to check for like terms. And this time it's tricky because they're kind of spread out. So my x squareds are right there. And then my um, six x's are there. So it's like every other term is a like term in a way. So the part that remains the same is the very first term, three x cubed, and the very last term, which is negative two. All right, so this is gonna be minus 19 x squared. Looks like the sixes have the same, they both have positives in front of them. So they're gonna turn into a positive 12 and then a minus two. Okay, let me kind of assess where we are. Okay, a lot of the rest of what follows, if I just kind of hard stop right there, you would have everything that you need to know to be able to work 6.4 problems. A lot of what follows is going to be shortcuts and just cute little learning devices, which they become more necessary the farther through algebra you get. But in the 6.4 world, a lot of them are not quite as necessary. We're not to the point in the course where it's just live or die by these things. So I want to put in the notes, um, if you can get this far, 
at this point, you can work um, 6.4 homework. Now, that being said, so just kind of when you're practicing, when you're practicing these problems, know that everything that comes past this stage is at this point in the course semi-optional. So I'm going to try to quickly go through that um, for the rest of the class. And I think what we'll do, just kind of making it up as I go, I think once I have this all just dumped on paper, I think we'll start Tuesday's class um, with a little bit of a, a workshop where you guys practice some of these um, and then I put it in the notes prior to, and then we'll think about the quiz. I'm not going to give you a quiz on this stuff over the weekend. I never really know how it feels till I get in the middle of teaching it, and then I realize, yeah, this is just too much. So this, what follows is shortcuts, fun, optional things. So I'm going to say this first thing is an optional technique. I don't care if you never do this vertical multiplication. And some of these techniques I'm going to show you are less optional than others, <laughs> meaning in the future, the book might reach back and grab some of them. But what I'm doing right now, this is totally optional. It's basically just a setup. If you feel like your mind is being boggled by all of these terms spread horizontally across your paper, you can restructure vertically because vertically is how we tend to multiply a lot of things anyway. Think about if I told you to multiply like 516 by 24, there is no way if you're, if you're like a normal American student, you're probably not going to put those things like next to each other horizontally. You're going to put one on top and then you're going to multiply the six and the four, they're in the ones place. And then you're going to move that four across to the one, four across the five, and so on. So if I restructure, and the restructuring here, um, typically the longer one of these guys is going to go on top, and the shorter one is going to go on the bottom, just like what, I'm, what I did here with the three-digit number and the two-digit number. It's really just the same process. And then as I multiply, the only problem with this is maybe it messes up your middle step where you show everything grouped together after the distribution, but you haven't yet multiplied. This isn't quite so good with that. Um, so super optional. You can have two times negative five, two times negative four X, two times X squared. So it works best if you can just go ahead and do the multiplication in your head. So another reason this is super optional. Um, and then the three X squared, that's going to multiply by the negative five. That's going to multiply by the negative four X. That's going to multiply by the X squared. And as you do that, um, you try to line things up according to their power of X. So three X squared times negative five, negative 15 X squared. Three X squared times negative four X, you get an X cubed and they, they stick this kind of awkwardly off to the side because there's nothing for it. There's no like terms for it to line up with. So I am not really sold on the benefit of this method at this stage because, you know, in the example I just showed you, there really only ends up being one pair of like terms. Um, that's great. But it does destroy the potential for you to write out that middle step we've been doing. It requires you to do more in your head. But it does relate the multiplication we're doing now back to the multiplication that you do with just plain multi-digit numbers. So if that appeals to you, feel free. Another 
optional technique that I want to skip so badly. But you guys have probably, you know, there's a high chance you've already heard this term before. So um, I don't want to skip it because it's just out there floating around. And this is if you happen to be, which we've already kind of run past this level of difficulty, but if you just happen to find yourself in a stage where what you're multiplying is a binomial by a binomial. And this technique is called FOIL. And the reason I'm hesitant to teach it is because once people learn it, they call everything foiling. And really, not everything is foiling. In fact, most things are not foiling. Um, so this stands for, this is a memory device, first outer, inner, and last. We were doing this without calling it doing this in one of our examples. And I'm not going to hammer too hard on this, I'm going to give us a nice, simple practice problem. Okay, so we've got binomial and we've got binomial. Now, if you do the multiplication exactly the way I told you to do, you would take this X and it would dance its way across like that. And then you take that negative five and it would dance its way across. The order that you do the multiplications, I think it comes out the same, but here's how we'll label this now. First piece to first piece, that's your F. Outer, you take the two elements on the very outsides, inner, That's these guys right here. You're on the inside. And then last. Same four multiplications. You're just reciting to yourself first outer, inner, last. <laughs> Max and Sarah, you're like bats right now hanging off the ceiling. I hope I'm not upside down to you. I don't know how that works. Thank you. We're trying, we're trying to charge the phone right now. That's a cell phone, right? Yeah, that's my cell phone does that to you all the time. First, outer, inner, last. And I will put the results there. First, outer, inner, last. But of course, it doesn't do anything about your like terms. You have to remember to move those together. And that's the answer. So if you like FOIL, if you've heard FOIL, um, you're welcome to use that. Just be aware of it only is technically FOILing when you have two terms times two other terms. If you have one times three, two times three, four times five, it's not technically FOILing. And I'm saying this because I'm as guilty as anyone. Once I learned the FOIL little device in my head, I have to work really hard not to call everything FOILing. It's kind of like that word canceling we talked about. We're not Everything is technically canceling, but once we learn it, we tend to love it. Um, gosh, I do not want to do these, but oh, goodness, there's only three of them. I'm going to call these special products. And I'm going to make a note, they are optional at this stage. Dot, dot, dot. And by this stage, I should mean specifically, maybe I should not say at this stage because that's really vague. I'm going to say they are optional in 6.4, meaning I don't care. The book might try to make us care. But in 6.4, I don't care if you use special products. Just know that um, in the future, I'm going to try to be really clear about this. In the future, 
one of them will be not optional anymore. Um, here they are. Let me just write these out. If you happen to notice that what you're being asked to multiply fits one of the following formats, you are welcome to have these things memorized and just whip it out without foiling, without distributing. And then this is the one that is at some point going to become not so optional. I want to be really specific here. Let me see if I can find the section because it is in chapter six. I don't want you to think it's not going to be till chapter 10 that you need this. It is, yep, 6.7. This last optional multiplication formula will not be optional in 6.7. So just know that one and two here, to me, always optional. It's great if you know them. It's not great if, or it's great if you don't know them. It's great either way. This number three here, this one becomes super important in chapter 6.7. So. I'll show you as quickly as possible some examples here. Yeah, and I'm going to save the really awful examples for next time, so I'll adjust the homework. So part A, if you have x minus 7 times x plus 7, this is an application of that rule three. Now they put their plus first. It doesn't matter. It's the same thing. As long as you have X and seven being subtracted in one of your sets of parentheses and you have X and seven being added in one of your sets of parentheses, all you have to do instead of foiling or distributing every single piece painstakingly across, you can just take that first piece, square it, slap a negative sign in between, take the other piece and square it. Now, if you didn't see that, if you wanted to go ahead and foil it out, you would get the same answer. Everything would condense, collapse back down to this at the end. So that's the good news. Um, because this is such an important one and eventually you're gonna need it memorized. Okay, the first item here is 2A. So I'm going to square that carefully. And here's where 6.2 can come back. You have something raised to a power the two will get legitimately squared like we're used to turn into a four. A will turn into A squared minus 25. Um, I realize I went out of order, but that's okay because what I was showing you is more important than what I'm about to show you, if I back up and just do a quick one of each of these, you have this squared, or if you have this squared, for example. So from the list that I had written out, I've got here a rule number one and a rule number two. And the a squared plus 2ab plus b squared, that's just something that you would have had to voluntarily memorize. So let's assume you voluntarily memorize this. What you would get, it's the first thing squared plus two times the first thing times the second thing plus the second thing squared. That's the application. So I'll put this, since we had to kind of lose in the notes, a plus b, that's a squared plus two a b plus b squared. So 
not, I, I don't know if at this point the brain power you need to use to memorize that is as valuable as just learning how to distribute FOIL in general. Um, I'm just doing my job, just making you aware of it. It's out there. And then similarly, um, Same idea here, a squared minus 2ab plus b squared. The only difference is it changes out the sign in the middle from a plus to a minus. So x squared minus 4x plus 4. So do I care if you ever use those on your homework? Absolutely not. Do I care if you use anything past, what's it? This stage in the homework or this stage in the notes on your homework? No, you'll be able to complete every single problem if you just do the same process over and over. I'm just showing you what the rest of the section is composed of. Um, and then as a hint, just this A plus B, A minus B thing, a couple sections down the road, that's gonna become like our bread and butter. Just not yet. Um, I'm gonna skip a couple of the hard practice problems and I'll make the homework reflect that. And then just because I mentioned um, back from the challenge problems earlier today, what happens if they decide to dredge up function notation and have you plug an addition problem into, so this is like what we did earlier. It's just a harder example, which I'm pretty sure I can whip out in five minutes. Okay, so we are having to plug a math problem. We're having to plug H plus one. And as we discussed earlier, as hard as it is to fight the urge to see those as two separate things, that is one input. H plus one is one input. And the rule that our function is telling us to use, whatever our input happens to be, we immediately square it then we multiply it times negative three. And then there's just a random plus five at the end of all of that math. So I'm going to try to line this up underneath F of, and I'll put that in in the orange in a minute. Really want it to line up perfectly with the original F of X so we can kind of compare those two. So H. Plus one, H plus one, H plus one. So you can kind of see the input used to be nice and simple. It used to be X and dealing with an X squared, not too bad. Now we're dealing with an H plus one squared. So this is something where if you would like, you could apply one of those optional rules what I'm going to do is kind of carry this off to the side temporarily and pretend that I don't care a thing in the world about those special rules, because honestly, I don't. What I can say is that H plus one squared is the same thing as H plus one times H plus one. To avoid the use of the, the extra memory work, I just write it twice and then I if you want to call it foiling, it's okay in this case. This is literal foiling. H times H, H times 1, and then 1 times H, 1 times 1. What that gets me is H squared plus 1 times H plus 1 times H plus 1 itself. So even if I did not use their cute special formula, this whole thing wouldn't be all that bad. And then I can just import it into what I'm doing. I have h squared plus 2h plus 1. That's the result. OK, the negative 3, this is back to the beginning of our section today, a monomial multiplied across very carefully. So we have negative 3 times h 
minus three times one. So that is this part. And then we have our plus five. So being extra careful with the H plus one, let's see how many sets of like terms we landed with. I think really we've only got two sets of like terms. Yeah, H squared's got nobody to combine with. That's H, that's negative two plus three. Okay, so that's the answer. So you can do the whole thing with the first techniques that we learned. You do not need their special way of multiplying out H plus one unless you just want it. Um, that's where I'm going to stop. I'm going to go back. I'm not going to write the homework on the board because I want to look carefully and make sure I'm assigning good problems. Um, and I'll email that pretty quickly out to you guys in the next couple minutes. So basically, homework um, coming by email. And then what's going to happen on Tuesday is that we will finish 6.4. There's only like one other thing I have to show you, but it's super hard. So we're going to finish 6.4. Then we'll work a couple 6.4 homework problems that you've already done. Um, just make sure, maybe I'll split you guys up, have Valor do some, have you guys do some. And then we will talk about when we're going to quiz on 6.4. And of course, we'll have to at least dip our toes in 6.5. So that's what's coming up. We don't worry about quizzing on 6.4, just kind of practice that over the weekend. So that's it. Let me go ahead and close out and I'll send you guys the homework in a couple of minutes. Thank you. Thank you for class. You're welcome. Thank you so much.